Hey, Soulmates, Friday. We made it. A ooh, holiday weekend Friday. And, and right on time. So it's a little extended for some of us folks. I love it. Uh, me too. Welcome to Fox Souls Black Report. We're following the latest on the NAACP travel ban on Florida and how the Soulmates are handling that and how affirmative action could impact college admissions. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm Nicole Cordelai Corte, plus the group that wants more visibility during Black History Month and the newest lawsuit against Kanye West. They're the stories that impact our people. We're gonna bring you our news, our views, our voice, and we're gonna get your weekend started, unfortunately, with something a little tragic out of, D, out of Mississippi, where an 11-year-old boy who called 911 uh, for help is recovering after being shot by a police officer. Investigators say uh, Adrian was shot in the chest while the officer responded to a domestic disturbance at the child's home. He suffered a collapsed lung, fractured ribs and more. The family is calling for the officer to be fired and charged in this shooting. And this is a tragedy, Courtney, that absolutely should have never happened before. Um, we know that uh, that the kid was shot after calling for help for his mom. Yeah. Um, he said that during the confrontation with his father that that uh, he was handed the phone by his mom and told to call the police and his grandmother. And so the kid was already traumatized by whatever was transpiring in the house. And then to call for help and have that help shoot you, I mean, it is a miracle that this kid is alive today. It really, it really does. And it brings to the forefront um, how heavy domestic violence uh, calls are. We often, you know, talk about police brutality or we talk about calls that involve maybe a mental crisis. Uh, I, I'm, I, I bet that maybe, you know, sometimes domestic violence uh, calls and mental crisis probably are hand in hand. But should there be a little bit more training when it comes to uh, domestic calls, seeing as though police officers, you know, get plenty uh, throughout uh, their shifts and have to deal with a myriad of situations, some of them very dangerous and volatile, such as this situation. So uh, I'm, I'm with you. We're hoping uh, the best uh, in this recovery and just the long road ahead to healing for, for this mm -hmm. family. And speaking of training, and we talk about this all the time, mm -hmm. right? You know, where is it in this police training that they would, they would come into the home and, you know, shoot at an 11-year-old kid? How did, how did that happen in the first place? And there's got to be something in the training to prevent those sorts of incidents from happening, no? And, 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 and from the surface, it would, it would appear, you know, no justification. I'm, I'm not, you know, maybe an overreaction, uh, maybe a very volatile situation where the child was not the intended target. I think we're just going to have to dig deep and wait for this investigation to become a little bit more well-rounded to understand why. And then from there, you can sort of kind of go into, you know, lack of training or, or what the next uh, recourse should be as far as these situations not ending up like this. Yeah. Well, moving along, the NAACP urges black residents of Florida to actively rally against Republican-led policies. The Civil Rights Organization issues a travel advisory warning of discrimination, of discrimination and mobilizing black voters. The advisory generates interest and promotes civic engagement among the community. The DeSantis administration dismisses the advisory as a mere stunt. NAACP emphasizes the importance of staying informed, engaging politically and voting to counteract discrimination and preserve black history. You know, we, we, we get together prior to the show and we discuss all of these headlines. And I think our executive producer, Aaron, uh, had a great point. He said, look, I'm going to Florida. He loves Disney. And he said, why not we add a little something to the conversation as in, go to Florida, but go support the organizations and the businesses that are fighting against DeSantis's politics. And I thought, ding, 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 that makes a lot of sense because let me tell you, the Miami Heat is on the brink of going to the NBA Finals. Uh, we are moving into the summer months. Miami is always a place where the soulmates go to party. You have places like uh, Disneyland and, and, and Orlando, which is the capital of the family vacation. And so we have to think, I, I'm not, you know, I'm down with what the end NAACP is saying here, but are there, are, is there any, any uh, alternative or option 
to this thought. Yeah, and, and to your point. How and, realistic and, and, is it really though? Yeah, you know? and to your point, to Aaron's point, uh, Leon Russell, who is the uh, chairman of the NAACP National Board, um, has, has said, quotes, let me be clear, we're not calling for a boycott or a travel ban. He mm -hmm. said, you know, we're saying the black people who come to the state uh, or who are thinking about coming to the state that you need to be aware mm -hmm. of what's going on here. You need to think about how you're going to be impacted by the hate and cruelty that's being generated here. And so this is much more of an awareness campaign. This is about getting folks dialed in that you know, maybe don't follow this stuff day to day, yeah. right? I mean, there are some people that follow the headlines day in and day out, but there are other people that kind of pop in. And so for the latter group, I think this travel advisory was for them. But I'm going to need the NAAC to be very careful. You know, sometimes as soulmates we hear what we want to hear we hear what we think we hear travel travel advisory travel ban just them putting this out here you know just brings up a lot and then you have to think about the folks the black folks the soulmates who who live and are from and love where, where they're from that being Florida my brother relocated to Orlando a couple of years ago he loves it he finds it to be you know a, a quite great living experience and I was down there a couple of times with my sorority we had regional meetings a boule down there yeah. Yeah. And I was surprised how black the county is as far as leadership and, and who's running things. So mm -hmm. we also have to think about the blacks who are already in Florida, who well, we, are from there. And, I don't know if that's fair and, to them. And for the blacks that are in Florida, some of which are family members of mine, there are some of them that say, well, wait a minute, Florida's not great. You know, for LGBTQ families that have little girls and little boys that are going to school there, mm -hmm. it's not so great. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and you know, for folks out there that, you know, want to admire the history makers like Amanda Gorman, the idea that her poem is being taken out of Miami-Dade schools, right? That's not so great. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, this is a travel advisory, yeah. not a travel okay. ban uh, you know, to Florida. Not okay. quite yet. We just clarified. You know, we, we always going to keep, you know, Florida top of mind in regards to what's happening. But if you need to go to Florida and get, get, your, get your weekend on, party on, whatever, I'd say go. But, I'd say go. But just be aware. Be aware. That's it. In an unprecedented move, 19 cities across the U.S. are actively settling lawsuits filed by protesters who suffered injuries caused by police during the 2020 racial justice protests. Now, the settlements totaling over $80 million are expected to increase as more lawsuits are resolved. The protests sparked by the murder of George Floyd saw millions rallying against racism and uh, police brutality nationwide. Protesters experienced various injuries from tear gas exposure to project projectile wounds leading to numerous civil lawsuits seeking justice while the settlements aim to compensate the victims financial challenges and ongoing medical needs persist. I mean these are a lot of settlements mm -hmm. Courtney how many mm -hmm. settlements have we reported on just right here on Foxhole's Black Report you know and it, it seems like we've never uh, seen you know this kind of avalanche of settlements from coast to coast I mean from New York to Philly to Atlanta Oakland Milwaukee you know, the list goes on and on. These are all different types of cities, by the way. Justin Hansford, who's a professor at Howard University Law School, called the total number of settlements unprecedented. Unprecedented. And so, you know, how much are we willing to pay to allow for police departments to skirt the kind of reforms that activists and advocates from across the country have been calling for even before George Floyd was murdered? Well, you know, money talks and, and BS walks. So maybe at some point these municipalities will get tired of having to pay out this money. If I can take from one of my heroes, Fannie Lou, Lou Hamer, you know, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, maybe they'll go about changing the culture. Maybe they'll go about, you know, doing some investigation that allows them to understand how they can go about changing the culture so these suits won't continue and they'll, you know, have to, they don't have to pay out this money and maybe the money can go to state and, and city services that the soulmates need. And I just you know? want to remind folks, this money is our money. Mm -hmm. It's taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are lots of other things we would much rather invest in, you know, than settlements over cases that seemingly could be avoided. That is my whole point. Mm hmm. Well, uh, moving along to South Carolina, where the Senate actively approves a bill that bans most abortions after approximately six weeks of pregnancy. And it's now awaiting the governor's signature. The bill reinstates a previous ban that was overturned by the state's highest court. South Carolina has been one of the few southern states where legal abortions were permitted, but that could soon change. The bill includes exceptions 
for specific circumstances, and doctors may face felony charges. Planned Parenthood plans to challenge the law, while Republican senators express confidence in its viability. All righty, so let's go to Ohio now, where Miami of Ohio women's basketball coach Deanna Hendricks resigned after, quote, intimate text messages were discovered between her and a player. Now, the university initially suspended her on April 20th and found that she violated the school's policy on consensual relationships between staff and students. Hendricks resigned rather than go through a hearing, but the reason was not disclosed. Her resignation letter included stipulations on what information can be provided to future employers and restrictions on any derogatory statements. An autopsy report obtained by Entertainment Tonight reveals new details about the tragic death of choreographer and DJ Stephen Twitch Boss. The report confirms no presence of drugs or alcohol in his system when he took his life on December 13th. Authorities discovered his body in a motel room after a, quote, ambulance death investigation call. Investigators found no signs of foul play and determined the cause of death to be a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. Boss's wife, Allison Holker, Holker Boss, recently shared that his struggles were hidden as he aimed to be everyone's protector. He leaves behind his wife, and three children. That is what is so scary. We just talked to an expert not so long ago and and you know they were talking about all the different signs and things like that, but I'm I'm just hearing so many times case by case we just didn't know. She seemed happy, he seemed fine, and you just heard this wife say they were hidden and they seem to be extremely close. I mean, I'm just looking from the outside in following them across um, you know, social media, extremely close, extremely connected, very much a family. Uh, and so I, you know, I know that that adds to the uh, devastation and no findings could ever bring, in my opinion, any kind of peace. You're just gonna have to work through that thing emotionally and allow that to, to settle in some kind of way so you can move on. I know she's got the kids to be strong uh, for and the courts awarded her which, you know, awarded her what was, you know, hers justly, if you will, so they can, you know, stay comfortable while the healing process continues. But that's what makes it so scary because you have folks out here taking themselves out with no signs. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you know, this issue hits very uh, close to home. Yeah, as I have a brother right. that uh, died by suicide, and so many of us didn't see the signs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's important, especially this Mental Health Awareness Month, that we remind people that there are out there are people out there that are functionally depressed, right? Where you're not going to see them, you know. Uh, you know, appear to be Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Or have an episode you know? or... Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you're not necessarily going to see that. And so I think we need to expand our mind and our thinking in terms of what signs to look for because sometimes, you know, they're not so visible. Mm -hmm. You know, just how sometimes the wounds that people have are not visible. And yeah. so, you know, our thoughts go out to uh, Twitch's family yeah, and uh, all the as families they're just who have beginning. Suffered their healing yeah, journey. Absolutely. All right, Lizzo delivered a powerful tribute to music legend Tina Turner during her performance in Phoenix Wednesday night, emphasizing the significance of Turner's influence. Lizzo, a black girl in a rock band, credited the queen of rock and roll for her own existence in the music industry. Get it, get it, Lizzo. She's always gonna give you some skin and some body. She energetically performed. <laughs> Turner, okay, Turner's <laughs> iconic song, Proud Mary, that you heard there, accompanied by Turner-inspired uh, dance moves as a sold-out crowd at the Footprint Center joyfully sang along. The heartfelt tribute took on even more meaning as news broke of Tina's passing at the age of 83. Fans in the arena captured and shared the unforgettable moment of Lizzo's homepage. Glad she's feeling better. Last we talked about Lizzo, she had to cancel some shows.
shows due to um, you know not feeling too yeah. hot. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, what what a very moving tribute. Um, I would imagine we're going to see a lot of these tributes as we're heading into the summer, mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's summer concert season. I mean, she was just such an incredible yeah. artist, an artist that will, I believe, stand the test of time. I mean, you know, I've been rocking out to Tina Tunes, you know, at home and in the office, yeah. you know, uh, ever since. And, uh, um, you know, I, I don't feel sad mm -hmm. about her passing because her music, her art is so timeless mm -hmm. that, you know, it doesn't feel like she's gone. Yeah, I think Does that for, sound weird? No, I think for fans, because we don't personally know them, you know, maybe that has to do with how we, we don't necessarily, it's not so necessarily heavy as far as the physical presence. You just know that something's not here anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, it's something that you, you want for forever, but we know that we, we move on. But like I said yesterday, Thank God for the music and the memories. Yeah. And that's how our faves uh, live on. She's one for the ages, though. That's right. That's right. Well, coming up, the rider strike doesn't seem to have an end in sight, but they now have mm. one popular supporter. Yeah, we'll tell you who's speaking on the side of the riders and how it could have a major impact in negotiations. That and more coming up, Soulmates. Stay close. You're watching Fox Soul's Black Report. And we welcome you back to Fox Soul's Black Report. So starting May 30th, our soulmates in Alabama who have had their supplemental nutritional assistance program, SNAP, benefits stolen can report the theft to the Alabama Department of Human Resources. That's right. The ADHR will provide replacement funds from the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. Alabama joins Oregon, Vermont, and Maryland as the fourth state to implement this program, the ADHR has already received around 300 theft reports since October 2022 with thefts increasing by millions of dollars. Commissioner Nancy Buckner stresses the importance of replacing stolen benefits to ensure continued access to nutritious meals for low income families. Former President Barack Obama is speaking up and supporting riders during their strike. The former president made his remarks during a promo event for his new Netflix docuseries, Working What We Do All Day. In the series, Obama follows around and interviews all kinds of workers across the country. Obama said, quote, my hope is that as somebody who's really supportive of the Writers Guild and as someone who just believes in storytelling and the craft of it, I'm hoping that they will be compensated and the importance of what they do will be reflected in whatever settlements they arrive at. You know, I'm just really excited uh, how the Obamas now can just say how they really feel mm -hmm. without there being, you know, some kind of platform, some kind of attack, some kind of whatever, um, because they are just telling us how they really feel about things. Michelle in particular, she's got the a new book out. She was on The Tonight Show and she she's become even more free or freer with her um, stories on, on family time and, and how they go about spending time and how now, look, her kids are out of the house, no more college tuition, me and uh, Barack are hanging. You know, I just love the honesty, mm -hmm. the transparency, and how now it was a great feat, don't get me wrong, to be in the White House in the, in the manner in which they were. Um, but to be free of that mm -hmm. so they can just speak their minds and speak on different topics and things. I love it. And this could make a really big difference in the writer's it strike. Could. Right now it almost feels like they're at an impasse. Uh, and so having the former president weigh in, that's a big win mm -hmm. for the writers. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's also, you know, be clear that, you know, the Obamas in their post presidential life, you know, have become a part of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they have a production company. That's right. um, they've uh, won, I think, at least uh, a couple Oscars uh, related to projects that they have uh, executive produced. And so, you know, I think they see. Uh, you know, up close and personal, uh, the impact that writers have on projects. And so uh, that is a really great uh, supporter mm -hmm. to have uh, who has a, a big following and can be rather persuasive. And pay the writers, pay the people, pay the writers. 
uh, we're going to end that story there and move on to U.S. colleges and how they are adapting strategies as Supreme Court uh, nears affirmative action decision. The decline in minority admissions after California's ban on race conscious admissions policy serves as a cautionary tale. Schools are exploring ways to expand recruitment, remove application barriers and improve financial aid offers. They are also strengthening connections with high school counselors and community based organizations to identify and recruit diverse applications. That's smart. All right. Admissions officers are also broadening outreach efforts to neighborhoods with lower incomes and educational attainment, focusing on racially diverse local high schools and community colleges. During Black History Month, Afro Latinos are leading a movement to ensure their contributions and experiences are acknowledged and celebrated. With a focus on education and curriculum, advocates emphasize the need for comprehensive representation of Afro-Latino history in schools. They aim to challenge the current narrative and promote a more inclusive understanding of blackness that encompasses the diverse experiences of Afro-Latinos. Now, by amplifying their voices, Afro-Latinos seek to reshape the dialogue and create a space where their heritage is recognized and valued during this important month of commemoration. And so, Courtney, maybe this next Black History Month in 2024 might be uh, might feel a whole lot different. Yeah, well, I, you know, I agree. They they are black, you know, as far as, you know, you know, we all come from Africa. So they, they are black. Um, and so the only difference, this is what I'm, I'm hearing them say is, you know, we just happen to speak a different language. So I think if we can like come come to the middle and agree that, you know, we are all black, we are all of color, but there are some 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 slight differences, you know, one being language Two, culturally, you know, the cookie may be a little different. Uh, how we go about celebrating and customs and traditions might be a little different because they are, you know, Afro uh, Latino. So, you know, let's let's acknowledge that as well. And, and I can just see a one all inclusive pot. I know we're not a monolith. That's our favorite <laughs> word here at Fox Souls Black Report. But I also Did you love, sense I, where I was going right, with this conversation. But I also love the differences. If I could have stayed with Spanish and, and had been bilingual, I'd be a quibillionaire somewhere. <laughs> a, you, you, a, a who? A quibillionaire somewhere. <laughs> really, I mean, you know, it, it just adds another layer. So I think it just adds to the richness of it all. We come in different varieties, and that's just what it is. Yeah, and it, it, would, it, it is it is important for us to recognize that Black folks transcend continents. We transcend cultures, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And you know, you know. Look at, you know, black folks in Brazilian, Afro-Brazilians, you know, look mm -hmm. at Afro-Cubans, you know, black folks are everywhere. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this ain't no news to me, it no. ain't no news to you, ain't no, ain't no yeah. news to a lot of and our soulmates, our but for the people where it is new news, news to yeah. them, yeah. right, or it is news to them, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully they lean into it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and hopefully, you know, we can come together and, and build our sort of political power together, mm -hmm. you know. Imagine if, you know, Black folks and Latinos, you know, everywhere, we're able to sort of come together, recognizing that, you know, there's a lot of of, of symmetry mm -hmm. in terms of the opportunities and challenges we experience as Black and Brown folks. Yeah. Well, you know, listen, I just say celebrate it all. And to this day, I'm, I, a lot of my relatives who had accents are, are going on to be with the ancestors, but. Even back then, I couldn't understand Patois. I couldn't get that thing <laughs> together to save my life. So listen, it just, it's just all good. It's all right. It's all good. Still ahead, there's a major gap in funding when it comes to HBCUs. That's right. We'll tell you how much there is a gap between the funding for HBCUs and Ivy League schools mm. when we come back. You're watching Fox Hole's Black Report. Welcome back to Fox Hills Black Report. Well, lawmakers criticized Tennessee State University and University of Tennessee Knoxville for their handling of student housing overflow. Now, the State Building Commission's Executive Committee approves a $6.78 million lease for 500 apartments at Lakemore Station for UT Knoxville, while TSU secures a $7.2 million lease for 269 hotel rooms in Nashville. TSU's housing shortage faced more scrutiny than UT Knoxville's raising concerns about equal treatment. That's right. TSU's enrollment surge and lack of on-campus housing highlights the need for affordable housing in Nashville. 
Both universities face calls for improved long-term housing plans to accommodate growing student populations. You know what I don't understand a lot of times is, you know, you, you send your babies off or you, you take them to college and you've got all this paperwork that you do prior to getting on campus and then to get on campus and to learn you don't have housing. I don't know how, how that happens. It, it wasn't uh, my experience, uh, but the thought of your child not properly being housed, you know, while they are out of your care, um, you know, that is that is scary. And then, you know, it is is the housing safe? Is that hotel where the, where's that hotel? What's the security like with, with that hotel? Where where are you placing my child? Mm -hmm. So there's so many layered concerns uh, and it just speaks to the need of how much more uh, we need to pay attention and to um, support HBCUs in that effort, especially as we've been reporting the popularity and the admissions mm -hmm. are raising, they're kind of bursting at the seams. And it's also a reminder that the challenges that big cities and medium-sized cities are experiencing in terms of affordable housing make life more difficult for students. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember you know the challenge around housing as a student in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. right? One of the most expensive places in the country to live, period. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, this is a reminder, you know, that this issue also uh, negatively impacts uh, students. But, you know, a lot of uh, colleges and universities will guarantee housing maybe your first year, you know, but after that, all bets are off. And so I don't know if that might have been the case uh, here, but to your point, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for colleges and universities to take a second look at that, you know? I mean, and, and as students are thinking about where they want to go to school, right, that's something to, to pay attention to. You know, do you have housing guaranteed only for the first year or for more than the first year? Yeah, it would definitely uh, redirect my decision. Yeah, indeed. All right, the average historically black college and university received less funding from foundations than the average Ivy League school in 2019. That's according to a newly released study by philanthropic research groups Candid and, uh, uh, Candid and the Association of Black Foundation Executives. Now, the study found that the eight Ivy League schools received over $5 billion from the largest U.S. foundations, while 99 HBCUs only received four. $45 million. Quite a disparity there, De Cordelot. A significant disparity there. Um, and, you know, it's just another reminder that we have got to do better by our HBCUs. I mean, they're not going to be able to, to fund themselves in the same way that a lot of other schools can. I mean, think about the billion dollars in endowments mm -hmm. that so many other schools have that many of our HBCUs don't, right? And so imagine if the federal government, you know, stopped funding HBCUs or had severe cuts to funding of HBCUs. You know, these are some examples of how, uh, you know, that would negatively impact, you know, our black students in real time. So let's start with what HBCUs uh, historically are, are owed, you know, in regards to land grants and land being stolen and taken away from them. Let's talk about that. You saw the fight with TSU and, and what they were owed by their state and that money that they got that we hope, you know, will be funneled back into that school to make it a, make it a better place, you know, the, the physical look of it and the aesthetics and the, and the education part of it. But let's, let's even go before we, you know, ask for the money that I believe that we should get in the support. Let's take a look at, um, you know, some history and, and what, you know, these states may owe HBCUs that sit on this now precious land that they want back and, and maybe something that was stolen or taken from them uh, and, and, what, and what they are owed. There should be some kind of commission to kind of take a look at that and use TSU as the model because they got a couple hundred million, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. in that fight. So let's just start there. Yeah. Well, Pay up. Lots to do, lots mm -hmm. to do. Well, the NCAA has reportedly turned down a proposal for a 2023 football showcase that would feature HBCU players. The proposal would include the game in week zero and would be a game between 2022 uh, champions of two divisions and two HBCU schools. The idea came from longtime HBCU sportscaster Charlie Neal, with the hopes that uh, the game would air on Saturday, August 26. Now, the NCAA turned down the proposal, many say because no Division II teams have ever participated in Week Zero games. But there's hope 
that the game could air in 2024. Yeah, big ups to Charlie Neal. I mean, he's one of the one of the pioneers. One of the when you think about HBCU sports, he's one of the the godfathers of of that whole push to to, to bring it into the mainstream. Um, equivalent to like uh, the the likes of uh, the late uh, Stuart Scott in regards mm -hmm. to just his his presence on air and his enthusiasm about not just you know sports but HBCU sports in particular. So big ups to to him. But you know I don't know I don't know what it's gonna take. It kind of just reminds me of this argument about you know our history is you know American history. Look HBCU sports is American sports. You know if 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 there wasn't wasn't for you know some African Americans you know being on these professionally professional for, professional sports teams, mm -hmm. you w really wouldn't have professional sports. So let's pay attention to where these athletes come from, to where, you know, the, the communities that they come from as far as them going to these HBCUs, whether they make it to leagues or not. Yeah. This is the this is the feeding ground here. Support it. You know, and just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean that they can't do anything right. a little bit different. Right. Just saying. Well, the, end, the Pepsi national battle of the bands returns on August 26th at NRG Stadium in Houston celebrating HBCU marching bands and raising scholarship funds. This event celebrates HBCU marching bands and raises scholarship funds for them. Pepsi is proud to be the title sponsor, supporting the achievements of HBCUs and their world-class marching bands. Now, the lineup includes top bands like Florida A&M University's Ooh. marching, a 100 and Texas Southern University's Ocean, Ocean of Soul, Soul marching band. That's right. <laughs> the event offers a refreshed website and a new mobile app for an enhanced fan experience. Don't miss this electrifying celebration of yeah. HBCU culture and musical brilliance. I don't know what other, other uh, sporting event you go to where you, you don't go to the bathroom or go get a snack during halftime. You stay right where you are at an HBCU football game because that sometimes is the game. Yeah. The battle between the bands. It's a beautiful thing. It is. It is. Have so you, talented. Have you ever attended one in person? I've never yes. been to been the one in person. I've actually hosted one. So there's one that would come to Chicago all the time, and you know Mobile is is the is the cradle. Yeah. Everybody's coming through that area. So yeah, and just the the artistry, the instrumentation, the creative mm -hmm. creativity, how those kids are young people, young adults are moving in all that heavy equipment and stuff, and it's hot. And they keep in formation. Amazing to me. I don't know if I, I'd be, I'd be done fell out. <laughs> really? But you would probably, you probably would have trained so hard for it mm -mm, that you would have mm -mm. been prepared for it. No. Saxophone is down. Somebody, <laughs> some, some, this, one of the saxophones is down. The cymbal person is down. Sister <laughs> on the floor. Sister on the floor. So big, big. Oh my ups. goodness. It's amazing, and just the vibe. You know, there's a there's a um, a, a reel going around social media where um, uh, HBCU was playing a P uh, WI, uh -huh. and they had the HBCU band over in the little corner, but they still rocked. And all you saw were were our Caucasian brothers and sisters going. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a whole experience. different experience. It's a whole other experience. You're absolutely right. I mean, I can't wait to check it out. You know, in person at some point. But mm -hmm. you know, for for the folks who haven't had a chance to check it out. Um, uh, I would highly recommend Beyonce's homecoming documentary because remember what part of what made that so cool is she had all those HBCU you bands You gonna find there. a way. <laughs> Every Fox Soul Black Report episode to swing that thing back around to Beyonce. We love her, but no, we would no. Why not? You but don't no get what? to do it no today. What? No what? It's Memorial Day weekend. Beyonce is probably Memorial resting. Day weekend. She's so, probably so, resting in between her gigs. All the all the reason why. During Memorial Day weekend, check it out. Homecoming on Netflix. Get into it. You know what else? Coming coming up, singer and actor Tyrese. He's sharing some movie secrets. We'll tell you which one of his major movies the star says he hasn't even seen. Are you kidding me? That's coming up. You're watching Fox Souls Black. Welcome back to Fox Souls Black Report. Now, according to TMZ, police paid Ja Morant a visit for a welfare check. That's right. This following the Grizzlies superstars. Social media posts, Morant reportedly told officers that he's taken a break from social media. So about two weeks ago, Morant was caught on Instagram Live 
in a uh, with a gun for the second time in three months. He has since apologized for the incident, but in response, the Grizzly suspended him from all team activities, and I do believe that's indefinitely so. And probably a good idea mm -hmm. that he's taking a break from social media because yeah. doesn't seem to be his uh, friend serving him very well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem uh, that he's making smart decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is an example for a lot of other folks on social media that, you know, sometimes get caught up posting stuff that, that uh, they don't want to be headlines mm -hmm. on Fox Soul's Black Report. And so uh, good for him that he's at least stepping back from social yeah, media. Yeah, and I said this before, you know, you are the sum of your choices. And right now, he it doesn't appear as though he's making the best or the healthiest uh, choices. But if you take it back to the good book, you know, Spiritually speaking, we are given chance after chance after chance after chance to get it right. But, you know, within that process, you're still going to have to deal with the consequences or the results of, of your actions. So um, I hope the best for this brother. He is, like I said before, he is destined to be one of the best to ever do it. When you, when you look back on, on basketball history and all the greatest of lists, he could be at the top for his generation, for this, for this generation of, of the NBA that we're in now. But man, you gonna blow this thing. Yeah, and, and speaking of blowing this thing, I mean, you heard about the, the Detroit Lions player that got caught up in, in the gambling scandal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, look, if people have their, their vices, people have sort of the things they do when they're off time to relieve stress or, you know, to, to have fun. You know, but, you know, you also got to think of, you got to act responsibly, yeah. right? You know, flashing a gun on social media, I don't understand, you know, um, you know what, you're, what you're trying to accomplish yeah. there. And I'm not making light of the situation, but as far as the football player is concerned, basketball money is way longer than football money. So I can see why he'd be a little enticed maybe to try to win some money on the side. Oh, the football players, they, you know, they get it tough. And then their, their representation, uh, the, the union, uh, I don't even know if they have one, but if they do, it's not as strong as, as them, as the NBA players, players association, right? Thank you. Uh, in my ear, it, it, you know, it's not as strong as that players, that NBA players union, NBA player, you are going to get to your money. You can hurt yourself. <laughs> you can out of backflip, jump, do what you need. You're going to get that money in football. It's quite different. So I can just see, I'm not condoning. I can just see how they can be a little mm. enticed to try to win a little something on the side. Well, you end up lose, losing a lot of something uh, yeah. if, if you keep that up. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm just saying. That's why people are so disappointed with Jod. Dude, you got it. it. You got this thing. And folks gave him a second chance. Yeah. Right? And so. We got you, Jod. Now he's working let's, on let's his third together. chance. But, you know, leave that social media alone, man. Yeah. Put them guns down. Put them away. Uh, moving along. Uh, this next one, is it's kind of hard to believe that in a recent interview, singer and actor Tyrese is sharing uh, one of his blockbuster hits that he's never, ever seen. Can you believe this? Yeah, I can. Many remember Tyrese making one of his first acting debuts in the culture classic Baby Boy, but Tyrese is telling his fans that he has never seen the first ever Fast and Furious. There has been 10 films in total, with the newest one being in theaters now, and this film has made uh, 50 gabillion dollars, and you mean to tell me. And they still call you back for the sequels, which means they value you mm -hmm. and your character. But you mean to tell me you've never just taken... You know what? I take that back. I can, I can see that, you know, in the moment. But after all these years, you've never seen it. I can see, like, you know, reruns of our show here mm -hmm. at Fox News Black Report that or we, we may not have seen the first run of it and you go. But eventually you go back and you tap in and you take a look. How was your hair that day? Was my lash coming off? Was, you know... To never go back and have looked at something that's been so successful and that has set him up, everybody in that Fast and Furious franchise has done very well. Yeah, I mean, it's strange to me because, you know, call me crazy, but I appreciate a good Genesis story. I want to know the origin of things, right? And, and, and so, you know, I would have wanted to look at the first one to understand, okay, how did this thing start to understand, okay, where is it that we're trying to take this thing? And mm -hmm. so it's a little strange to me, but to each its own. Have you, you know? seen Fast and Furious? I've seen uh, Fast and Furious. I haven't seen all 10 of them. I didn't know there's 10 of them, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen them. It's a major franchise. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm just a bit surprised that, you know, he wouldn't want to go back and see the first one. But clearly it's working for him. Yeah. And they keep that phone keep ringing and every and it's Vin Diesel right that's uh -huh. the that's the that's the main guy right uh -huh. yeah okay 
All right, well, maybe, you know, we'll have some downtime soon. I'll catch up all, all, t <laughs> all t <laughs> All right, The Gap is suing Kanye West for $2 million over their failed Yeezy collaboration. That's right. The clothing change reportedly wants Kanye to foot the bill for a lawsuit it's facing. Gap claims that uh, Kanye is responsible for making, quote, unapproved changes to a Los Angeles property that it was renting during the 2021 and 2022 Yeezy collab. The company that claims to own the building, leased to Gap, sued the clothing giant last year over damages made to the building. Oh, Yeezy, you know, I don't know. I feel like, okay, yeah, maybe you need to sue to get what you needed, but, but if you got it, like, just go on and fix the building yourself if it's not too major, and leave Yeezy alone. He's been very quiet lately. Shh. <laughs> Don't stir him up. Let him be. You know, if the damages are something that, you know, you can cover and it won't put you in the red, just fix the building. Leave Yeezy alone. But that's not how this works. You know, that's how it needs to work for Yeezy. Gap, Gap is res Gap ain't responsible for Yeezy. Gap is responsible to their shareholders. The Gap got it. The Gap's got it. Gap shareholders said, uh uh. The Gap Ye shareholders has it because Ye Ye no. did it. Shh. He's been very quiet lately. <laughs> that is not Leave how it works. Yeezy alone. I don't care how quiet Please, he is. Gap. Gap, chill. <laughs> we'll come and paint and do some stucco and. Who? And, Who's we? <laughs> And lay some cement and stuff. We got you. You over here volunteering for What's it called? Do it just a DIY? DIY? Why? Yeah, we got you, Gap. Leave you easy alone. Oh, we ain't working for Gap for free. Something a little serious here. Another Migos member is working on a solo project of his own and opening up about his struggles. That's right. Rapper Offset is sharing his journey with kicking his codeine addiction, mm -hmm. plus how he's dealing with the loss of his longtime friend Takeoff. In an interview with Variety, Offset reflected on his last song with Takeoff and says that he still finds it painful mm. to talk about it. And in a big reveal, the rapper admits that he's not actually related to Cuervo or Takeoff, but acknowledges that their bond was strong, which makes maybe the riff a little bit more understandable. I mean, you 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 look friends because blood isn't necessarily, you know, thicker than water, if you will. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. And and so I can see how, you know, people who you have come up with and, and learned and grown with, how they become more family than the family that you have. But it also kind of lends to, you know, m maybe why the riff was the riff, if you will. Because you can you can riff with your family, but they always going to be your family. Yeah. You know, but with someone who isn't necessarily family, sometimes there's not an urgency to fix that riff. Um, but that blew my mind, you know, hearing that. But sounds like he's... He's talking it out, you know, through these interviews, this self-actualization, mm -hmm. and he'll land in, in a better place. Yeah, and, you know, and, and the healing journey is only beginning. It's going to take a long while. I mean, that was a very traumatic experience mm -hmm. that, that he and so many others, uh, you know, experienced with, with the, 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 the killing of takeoff. But this is also just a reminder of just sort of the state of affairs. I mean, how many stories have we reported on of these young rappers whose lives have been cut short uh, too soon? So whether, mm -hmm. you know, we're talking about the memory of Nipsey Hussle or we're talking about uh, the 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 uh, uh, memory of um, uh, Pop Smoke uh, and some of the other folks. I mean, you know, this is uh, the epidemic of gun violence, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to think about that in the abstract. You know, there are some highly visible folks in our community uh, who have been the victims of and at times the perpetrators yeah. of. And a lot of times when these young men and women, you know, hit big, whether it be, you know, the, the traditional road to becoming a superstar, lots of times now it's all about hitting on TikTok or Instagram and you blow up. A lot of times they're, they're, they are the ones who, has, who have made it out who made it big. Mm -hmm. And so just like a lot of the uh, athletes, you know, they become the providers. They become the ones who, you know, support entire villages. And so when something so tragic happens, you know, not only is it a, an emotional loss, but a lot of times, you know, financially, it, it leaves these families, especially if they're leaving behind wives and, ch and, and children and mothers and siblings, it leaves those families uh, in, in shambles. So it, there's just a lot that comes along mm -hmm. with these type of 
losses and these hits that the younger hip hop community uh, is taking. And it's it's unfortunately far more frequent than, than my generation. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you you my generation now is 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 going on to be with the ancestors because our bodies are given up or you know um, you know something of, or we're just aging out if you will um, but this this young this younger generation it, it breaks my heart because I don't I don't know who's going to be left you know they, we're going to be remembering everybody instead of celebrating 50 years of this generation yeah. of hip-hop you yeah. know what I'm saying but you know what if there was a silver lining in this story I think the silver lining is that he is uh, being uh, upfront and outspoken about kicking his addiction. Yeah. You know, there are not a lot of people that talk about their addiction to anything, let alone their addiction to codeine. And so, uh, you know, salute to him uh, for recognizing that he has a problem, mm -hmm. right? And that, and getting the support that he needs, the help that he needs in order, in order to manage that addiction. Yeah, and we hope with him being so open and transparent that those, you know, who, you know, he touches and reaches and influences will we'll follow along as far as their healing yeah. uh, is concerned, that's for sure. Well, moving along, Oscar winning actress Lupita Nyongo is responding to rumors that she's secretly dating Janelle Monet. I don't believe it, but for years now, rumors have circulated that the two have been together. But Lupita told Rolling Stones this week she has magnetism that they were obviously picking up on, that she is uh, in... Ig, ig, Igmatic? Yeah, I think that's it. People are curious about Igmatic. Maybe you can expound on that for us, Dr. Nicola Blacorte. I was not surprised, and I don't mind being associated with her in any capacity. Obviously, they, you know, they are just fond of each other. I follow uh, Lupita, and there was this guy that dipped into her DMs, and they talked for a long time. Yeah. And then they finally connected. They sat next to each other. I take that back. They sat next to each other, maybe on a flight and I think he reached out or something like that. But yeah. anyway, they connected, got together, and I think you still see, because I follow her, I think you still see them all over uh, social media because they, they finally made their relationship public. But, you know, listen. Go where love is. Go okay. where, go, is that go, what that word go, meant? Go, go where what love is. Y'all got fancy on me, <laughs> writers. Go, <laughs> Miranda. Go Aaron. where, go where love is. Go where joy is. Go where the and, and, and 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 I can that? appreciate the fact that you know what, uh, Lupita wasn't scared at all. She's like, you know, if y'all want to think we're dating, go right know, ahead. That's a compliment. He's like, he's like, I would love to be associated. She said she would love to be associated with Janelle Monae um, in any way, shape, or form. I think a lot of us would. She is mm -hmm. an incredible, uh, dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, energetic and uh, has a, uh, artist. And uh, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? And has a great vocabulary, because that was a quote. <laughs> I got to go look that word up. Up next, it's our favorite part of the show, Black Excellence. That's right, Black, Black Excellence. Excellence. Black <laughs> Excellence. We'll tell you all about the newest Black-owned dispensary what? in New York City. You're watching Fox Soul's Black Report. Come on back. Welcome back to Fox Soul's Black Report. Hey T is a Black-owned news app that is now become the largest source of black podcasts led by black hosts. Yeah, Haiti, H-A-Y-T-I, had already cornered the market as a resource for print and on-air news by black publishers. But with its expansion into podcasts, it further cemented its legacy. Haiti launched in 2021 and was the first mobile app to feature over 200 black publishers available to both Android and iOS users. Now, uh, users will have access to over 2,000 black podcasters. We love to see it. Yeah. CEO Carrie Willis believes this move keeps the app aligned with its mission to provide culturally relevant and meaningful content as the objective is to influence and disrupt cultural narratives and put the spotlight solely on black creators who are not properly celebrated. I love it. That's the whole premise of Fox Soul. Uh, you know, to to celebrate, you know, our voice, our views, our news, you know, without being interrupted as far as our thoughts and and the and the way we move in this world. And so, uh, big ups and and salute to uh, this uh, CEO, young CEO, and uh, Haiti for 
uh, pushing through and and providing more black centered content. We need we need more. You know, I know that I know that you know at some points we might be competitors, all the different black outlets, but it's really a collective effort uh, to move our voices yeah. and to move our culture forward. Yeah. So you gotta love it. We do. There's a lot to love. New York City's newest weed dispensary opens with a sister running it. That's right, a sister. The opening <laughs> of Good Grades Cannabis Dispensary in Queens, New York, made many historic firsts. Among the first six retail dispensaries in New York State, it's the first to open in Queens and the first woman-owned dispensary to be financially supported by the state's Social Equity Investment now Fund. Now we talking. So the dispensary is a big change for the neighborhood as Jamaica is a largely African American and Latino community there in New York that historically faced disproportionate cannabis criminalization until recreational can cannabis was legalized. This was back in 2021. Love to see it, yeah. This is a big deal. It I mean, is. you know, look at how far we've come. Remember when uh, you know, we were, were talking about how black folks have been sort of shut out, mm -hmm. you know, from the opportunity to own dispensaries, mm -hmm. to get these, uh, these licenses. Uh, and, you know, look, you know, New York is figuring it out quick, fast, in a hurry. Detroit. And, and you know, Detroit's figuring it yep. out. There are a number of other cities that are figuring mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. You know, this was in, an industry that not too long ago was very closed off to us. And so, you know, we need to see more uh, examples of stories like this, you know, where we see the industry beginning yeah. to open up to us. I love to see it. And I love the policies in place in order for this to continue to happen and for, you know, the culture to continue to flourish if this is a, a, a choice, an entrepreneurial choice. You know, I've been scared straight. I don't, I don't, I don't participate or partake, but I support, uh -huh. you know, especially, you know, small business, entrepreneurial black business. But, you know, when, when I'm mistaken, a, a Rice Krispie treat <laughs> one time, and I thought it was a Rice Krispie treat and it was not. <laughs> and I thought it was, and I ate most of it. And that thing came back on me as I was, you know, enjoying a holiday with my family on my patio. And I started crying and then laughing and then crying and laughing. Um, <laughs> I've been scared straight ever since. I can't do it, but I support it for the full rundown. We support you. <laughs> Thank you. On today's stories and more, you can access Fox Soul's video on demand on any partners, any of our partners. You can even access uh, shows and black centered content. And don't forget to uh, download the Fox Soul app and check it out over this Memorial Day weekend. I'm Courtney Hicks. And I'm Nick Cordelai Corte. On behalf of the entire team here at Fox Soul's Black Report, have a happy Memorial Day. Stay lifted and stay clear of these Rice Krispie and treats. And stay safe and stay away from the Rice Krispies. <laughs> Smell them first or something. Or ask somebody. You will be hurting. <laughs> hurting.